The world's population is around 7.8 billion. We grow food to feed 10 billion. Yet, world hunger is still increasing by 10 million a year, and over 2 billion do not have regular access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. Yes, hunger remains entrenched globally as a result of persistent poverty, poor governance, and marginalization of the most vulnerable. Food systems must be transformed fit for purpose. We must forge new partnerships. We cannot continue to think of issues such as hunger in isolation. We need energy sufficient, nutrient adequate, and healthy diets. We need to educate consumers on how to respect food, what makes up nutritious food, and how to reduce food waste and food loss as all diets have hidden costs such as non-communicable diseases. We need policies across food supply chains to enhance efficiencies. We need to implement efficient international and internal trade and marketing mechanisms. We need nutritious, sensitive social protection. We need innovation to drive production of food at lower costs. We need to grow our small-scale producers who produce 80% of Africa's food. They have a crucial role to play. In essence, innovation in business, technology, cooperation, global coherence, and solidarity will accelerate our drive to end hunger and achieve food security. Africa has the opportunity to build back better and build the continent. We invite you to join AGRF and its partners to lead in this recovery. Join us to accelerate the critical investments and policy changes needed to transform current food systems to make them able to deliver affordable health diets for all. Unpack Nutrition Indicators. This event is being recorded. By participating, you show your willingness to be recorded. I am Earthrin Cousin. I am the Senior Fellow or Distinguished Fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and a Senior Advisor at Stanford University and CEO of the Food Systems for the Future. I'm very pleased to moderate today's program. We'll begin with our keynote address by Dr. Lawrence Haddad. Dr. Haddad is a, a World Food Prize winner. Dr. Haddad now serves as the Executive Director of GAIN. Nutrition has been his life's work. And he was the founding co-chair and lead author of the Global Nutrition Report. Prior to that, he served as director of the Institute of Development Studies and division director at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Haddad. switch to share screen so you can hopefully see my presentation. Bear with me. Can you, can everyone see that? Yes. Erin, can you see anything? Yes. Yes, great. Okay, good. So um, thank you, Earthrin, um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's, it's a delight to, to be participating in the AGRF. 
Uh, as Othran said, my name is Lawrence Sadat, and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, or GAIN. Can you see the next slide, Othran? Yes. Yeah, good. So GAIN, the GAIN together with uh, Professor Jessica Fanzo and her team at Johns Hopkins University, and all the other partners you see here, uh, are proud to show you around the new food system dashboard, which is hot off the presses. We uh, developed the dashboard over the last three years in response to a, a felt need from a range of potential users, policymakers, businesses, international agencies, researchers, and civil society groups. They've all been scrabbling around for quality data to understand their food systems. They needed to describe and analyze their food systems as a basis for action to transform them. So working with our partners, we pulled in data for all countries from 30 different sources, mostly public, but a few private as well. And we identified and quality screened 170 indicators, organizing, organizing them by where they sit in the food system. So you can see this is the organization from the high-level panel of experts from the CFS a couple of years ago. And the, organ the indicators are organized by whether they are drivers of the food system, urbanization, population, income, trade, or by food supply, food environment, individual preferences and aspirations, diets, nutrition outcomes, and increasingly environmental and livelihood outcomes. Now, the main aim is really to help stakeholders describe their food systems, diagnose their food systems, and then to help them decide what to do to transform them. Now, we're still working on the diagnose and decide functions with support from a number of key partners, including the Rockefeller Foundation, the Government of the Netherlands, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation and USAID. But there is more than enough in the dashboard right now to help users zero in on problems and help them explore options for actions. Let me give you a couple of examples. For example, say you're a policymaker in Uganda and you're trying to figure out how to reduce the high levels of mortality due to heart disease, cancers, and diabetes. And you can see the number for Uganda here is high. And it's especially high relative to its neighbor, Kenya. The dashboard tells you that the chances of dying from these diet-related diseases in Uganda are 22%, yet in neighboring Kenya, they're only 13%. So what's going on? Well, the first thing to do is to look at diets. And we know that vegetable consumption is really important to stave off some of these diet-related chronic diseases. Well, the dashboard tells us that vegetable consumption in Uganda is almost half of what it is in Kenya. And also, the price of vegetables in Uganda, as you can see here, is higher than it is in um, Kenya. And you can see from this slide that the supply of vegetables in Uganda at 70, 78, 79 is a lot lower than it is in really of vegetables. The yield of vegetables in Uganda at 56K is only one third of what it is in Kenya. The productivity of vegetables, the quantity and, and the uh, value of vegetables that you can produce for the same area uh, in Kenya is three times of what it is in, in Uganda. And finally, on the demand side, Uganda does not have a set of dietary guidelines, but Kenya does. And Kenya's dietary guidelines stress the need to eat vegetables. So compared to Kenya, Uganda has higher levels of diet-related chronic illness, lower consumption of vegetables, more expensive vegetables, a lower supply of vegetables, lower productivity of vegetables, and no dietary guidelines on vegetables. So 
One approach for decision makers in Uganda is to explore. Is it, is it that supply needs to be boosted of vegetables to drive down the price, perhaps by boosting ag productivity? And, and on the demand side, is one way of building and boosting demand by developing and communicating food-based dietary guidelines. That's one example of how the dashboard can help you uh, as a decision maker identify a problem and begin to zero in on some potential options for addressing that problem. And now I want to talk about um, what the dashboard can do for businesses. How can, business, how can it help businesses trying to map emerging markets for healthy foods? And look at Gabon. Gabon is a small country, uh, and, it's, and it's a relatively well-off country in Africa. But its, it's, it's food system is very typical of, the, of the, uh, what we think many food systems in Africa are going to be like in five or ten years' time. So it's, a, it's an important example of what might be happening in other countries. So let's look at Gabon. The, the dashboard tells us that it's got one of the highest consumptions of sugar-sweetened beverages in Africa. So think of soda, for example. Gabon also has one of the highest levels of type 2 diabetes in Africa. And of course, the two are linked. So, so maybe, there's a, maybe there's a business opportunity here. So if you're, if you're a business looking to develop a sweet but low sugar alternative to soda, is Gabon a good place to develop your business? Well, the dashboard indicators will tell you that the cost of a nutritious diet is not a big constraint in Gabon. If you look at this slide, you'll see that the cost of securing a nutritious diet is only 37% of a typical household food expenditure. So that's very, that's very affordable. So it doesn't seem like income levels, at least on average, is a, is a big constraint to acquiring a healthy diet. We also know that income levels in Gabon are relatively high um, we, for, for a number of reasons. Inequality we would like to see lower, but on average, income levels are quite high. Also, there are no policies on marketing junk foods to kids. Right? So that means there's more room for different manufacturers and, and businesses to differentiate their products than if there was a level playing field. And, of course, in Gabon, there's a big urban population. 89% of the population is urban, with, a, with a, presumably a good access to electricity. And even in the rural populations, as you can see here, even half of the rural population have access to electricity. So... Gabon seems, if you're a business, it seems like an excellent prospect for a business that is aiming to produce and market healthy, low-sugar foods and beverages. The demand for sweet foods is there. Diabetes is a significant public health issue. Incomes are relatively high. Urban markets are relatively strong. Cost doesn't seem to be a major constraint to healthy eating. Electricity is, is accessible if one of the foods is going to be uh, require refrigeration. And the regulatory playing field doesn't force every company to do the same thing. But finally, we want really one of the big users of the Food Systems Dashboard to be the 2021 UN Food System Summit. The dashboard does lots of things that I haven't shown you because I don't have enough time to to show you everything, the best thing to do is to go on to the website and play with it. One of the things the dashboard does is it classifies all countries' food systems into one of five types. And you can see that on this slide. And this kind of analytical work can really support the summit's action tracks. Now, we are currently busy adding data on climate, environment, and livelihoods as outcomes. Our food systems are complex, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we need data to demystify them. We need data to spark and guide transformative action. Otherwise, we're just flying blind. And the world deserves better than that. Uh, looking back from 2030, we want to see the summit as the time when 
the indicators of the health of people and planet began to bend more strongly in the right direction. Now, the dashboard can help. Please use it. Please share it. Help us improve it. And most importantly, act on it. Thank you, Erthrin. that will hopefully get our audience thinking about how the nutrition indicators can help us better make decisions, particularly government and business, on how to move our, our food systems in a direction that provides better access to more nutritious foods, as well as the changing the consumption for the consumer, getting us to the place where we're making decisions based upon data and fact. What a fantastic tool for the entire community. Now let's open up this conversation to our to include our panel. Let's begin with two members of the panel. Uh, Ms. Indidi Wunelli is a co-founder of the Sahel Consulting and serves as its managing partner. Indeedy has 20 years of experience in international development. Through her work with Sahel, she has shaped agriculture strategy and policy and launched innovative businesses and ecosystem solutions in partnership with clients in the public and private and nonprofit sectors. Indeedy is also the co-founder of AACE Foods, Chair of NourishingAfrica.com and founder of Leap Africa. Also joining us today is Ms. Tato Moagi. She's a farmer. We always need farmers on this, on this, on these panels. And most importantly for today's conversation, she's the managing director, director of Banaran Farms. Tato Moagi is an agripreneur developing and managing farm operations in South Africa. Tato has served in various leadership positions, being selected as the first South African to be nominated as a Newfield International Farming Scholar in 2017. She is an advocate for social development in the agri-food sector and advises the Presidency and African Farmers Association of South Africa. Tedo was awarded Young Farmer of the Year in 2015. Let's begin our discussions by, uh, with one question to, that I'd like each of you to respond to. Both of you come from the private sector. Thedo, as a farmer, and Ndidi, you work throughout the entire value chain. You're in the food business. Are you also in, in the nutrition business? And if you consider yourself in the nutrition business, how do you measure nutrition impact, the nutrition impact of your work? Let's start with you, Ndidi. Thank you very much, Etran, and delighted to be on this panel. So I started uh, my voyage into this industry because I was propelled by this stark data. At that time, 41% of Nigerian children were stunted. And today it's 37%, still too high. The other statistic that was so glaring was that 40 to 60% of our fruits and vegetables go to waste. Waste foods. Ace Foods is now 11 years old, to really address the challenge of malnutrition in Nigeria, ensuring that we can process local food for our people and address the high rates of malnutrition. Today, Ace Foods sources from about 10,000 farmers and we process a range of complementary foods and spices, seasonings, and other products to address malnutrition. So I am firmly in the nutrition business. Sahel Consulting also works with private companies across Nigeria and across West Africa, also in the nutrition landscape. Now, how do we measure our impact? It's tough to measure impact because we don't have enough data, especially granular data at the local level. All of us can talk about national aggregated data, but we don't have a lot of local data. 
So we have a lot of anecdotal evidence of those who have used our products and how it's changed their life. We also have evidence about how our innovation has reduced the cost of food, making it more av available and affordable for the masses of people who ordinarily would not be able to afford it. And then we can see through our catalytic role in the industry, how many new companies have entered the ecosystem because of us. And so that's what we hold on to. But there are a few key issues. Clearly, food is still too expensive. And that's why industry and more private companies need to work together to reduce the cost, but also hold our governments accountable for creating an enabling environment for private companies to thrive. And Didi, why don't you and I keep going until we can get um, until we can get Theta back on the screen? When you talk about the lack of data, how do you access data today? So we depend a lot on the DHS survey, which is conducted in Nigeria. Um, the last survey was about 2018, 2019. And that's why when Lawrence and Jessica Fanzo launched the food systems dashboard, we were so excited. In fact, we reached out to them and said, can we please partner with you to make sure we have a Nigeria version? Because even in the food systems dashboard as it exists today, there's not a lot of country specific granular data. So we depend a lot right now on what government can provide and Nigerian Bureau of Statistics and what we're able to generate ourselves. And we have to collect a lot of primary data, Ethren. We have consultants across the board, our staff collect primary data, and it's expensive as a company, as a private company, to collect data. Unlike other parts of the world, we don't have Nielsen that's very active in a country like Nigeria. So you can't you know, pay relatively low amounts of money to understand how consumers are utilizing your food and how frequently they're purchasing it. So you depend a lot on your sales statistics and the demand. But clearly, if we're going to address these challenges, Etran, we need to also partner with the media, partner with faith-based organizations, community groups, and NGOs to increase the demand for nutritious food, to educate our people about what is nutrition, what is nutritious and what is not. And to actually name and shame companies that are also violating a lot of standards, misrepresenting food, uh, and addressing food fraud. Because there's a growing issue around food fraud in Africa. It's not just about nutritious food that's available, but it's also the food that's being sold and being misrepresented is damage to our people. And that has to be um, addressed through a co collective partnership between the government, the private sector, and civil society. And that cooperation between multi-sectoral partners is key to uh, achieving the goals that we all recognize as necessary. Let's go to Theto Moagi, um, who we have already introduced, and ask specifically, is there a way for the nutrition indicators to influence the work that you perform on your farm? And what value do you see for nutrition indicators in supporting the private sector, particularly in accessing investment capital? Theto? Well, I'm going to ask you then, Ndidi, since you are my private sector person that I have on the screen to answer those questions for our audience today. Well, I think this is a great time to be an African entrepreneur engaged in nutrition because there's growing, growing global awareness about healthy diets and the importance of healthy diets for a healthy population. So investors are coming out of the woodwork to actually partner with companies that are committed to local sourcing, but also committed to producing nutritious food. Um, and so through many hats, I can assure you that we are involved in this as well. Sahel Capital, a sister company, which manages a fund for agriculture financing in Nigeria, provides private equity to this group of entrepreneurs committed to addressing nutrition. Through nourishingafrica.com, which I co-founded, we're also supporting entrepreneurs with accessing financing and ensuring investment readiness. And a key competitive advantage is innovation again around the availability and affordability of nutritious food. 
We're also seeing a lot of development partners working with organizations such as the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, the Scaling of Nutrition Network, to say, how can we support more local entrepreneurs that are sourcing locally? So I'm beginning to see a lot of uh, excitement in this area. Obviously, we need more excitement. We need more interest. But it's bubbling up, Etran, and that gives me a lot of comfort and a lot of confidence. Well, that confidence, if you have confidence, then I know that we're making progress because you're a leader in this space in the private sector. Let's bring in some of our, the, our other two panelists who um, are from the, the, the civil society side of this work. Particularly, specifically, let's go to first Dr. Barbara Wells, who's the Director General of the International Potato Center, the CIP. Barbara was previously Vice President of Global Strategy at Agravita Inc., a firm that develops enzyme solutions for animal, animal nutrition, biofuels, and bioproducts. For many years, she served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Arbor. Ar Arborgen Inc., a global forestry tree seedling and tree breeding business. We also have on in this section of the panel, Dr. Johan Swinnen. Dr. Swinnen is the Director General of IFPRI. Johan Swinnen became Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, otherwise known as IFPRI, in January of 2020. He is a member of the Champions 12.3 Leadership Group to reduce food loss and waste in the SDG in the SDG Target 12.3, and also serves on, as the Commissioner of the Food Systems Economics Commission. So let's start with you, Barbara. As the Director General of CIP, must much of your work, like Dr. Haddad's, has focused on nutrition. Over the last 20 years, what do you believe has changed in how CIP approaches improving nutrition outcomes? Well, thank you, Erthren. Um, I would have to say that your question is not a simple one uh, because as we look at understanding the, all of the interrelated factors that impact ensuring that all people have access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food is a very complex matter indeed. Um, despite major increases in food production, access to balanced, healthy diets remains an increasing challenge, as was noted in the Global Nutrition Report, as we also know from the recently released SOFI report, unhealthy diets and malnutrition remain among one of our greatest challenges. In fact, our food systems, as was really well pointed out by Dr. Haddad, uh, from a production to consumption must be, in fact, reassessed and ensure that nutrition-dense diets are available for all. And food injustices are prevalent. Low-income consumers tend to rely heavily on staple foods for their calorie intake. This is driven by affordability and availability. And as was also mentioned this morning earlier, emerging evidence from the impacts of COVID suggests that this may be even a greater shift to staple foods as household resources available to purchase food decline further. Nutrition and food security has always been among the top priorities for CGIAR centers. And this will even be further emphasized under the 1CG 2030 research strategy. While the solutions to ensure nut nutrient diverse diets are complex and multifaceted, one area that has been a very high priority for CJR and our partners has been to enhance the micronutrient content of key staples. To date, 11 biofortified crops with enhanced levels of vitamin A, iron, and zinc have been developed together with our national partners and now are benefiting some 50 million people so over the last 20 years, getting to your specific question, the International Potato Center and our national partners have been at the forefront of this effort in breeding and introducing locally adapted, 
pro-vitamin A sweet potatoes into the diets of those with the greatest need. In fact, three of our scientists won the World Food Prize in 2016 for their biofortification work in the vitamin A packed orange flesh sweet potato. We have developed and introduced locally adapted varieties with our national partners in 16 African countries, benefiting nearly 30 million people. We have worked closely with government and local organizations in several countries to raise nutrition awareness. We have learned throughout this journey that to get true changes in dietary practice at the household level, we must invest in nutrition education at the community level. This includes involving community leaders as well as local health service providers. Together with private sector entrepreneurial partners, we have also been at the forefront of developing small to medium business opportunities utilizing shelf storable orange flesh sweet potato puree to produce vitamin A biofortified baked goods like breads and biscuits. Such businesses and enterprises create demand for the crop produced by the farmers. They create employment opportunities for women and youth and create income opportunities for the business owners, all in the while consuming, uh, supplying consumers in rural and urban communities with healthy, biofortified, nutritious food. Now, this is only one aspect of a very complex uh, a process, but we have been, in fact, very focused on improved nutrition um, at the household level um, for more than 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wells, for those very insightful comments. I understand that we have access to Theto now from the private sector. Is that possible to have her come in and talk to us about how nutrition indicators and the access to data and nutrition indicators is changing her work on the farm? And for and it's fantastic to have you have overcome those challenges and we definitely need to hear your voice for as uh, as the representative of farmers on this panel yes as a farmer uh, it is very important that we um, really deliver the, the right nutritious food for the people that that consume our food and I think one thing that we are deeply rooted at, um, especially at Lakhar Labanaring, is we, we, we think it's very important that African people start accessing food that is suitable for their genetics. In South Africa, 60% of people uh, have diabetes and hypertension. And um, this is really instigated by the food that we consume and how processed the food is. And at Lakhar Labanaring, we are very focused on growing indigenous crops. Um, these are crops that, you know, our grandparents used to eat um, in the rurals. And now that we've moved to urban spaces, we no longer have access to these foods. Um, and this has given us opportunity. And how can we deliver these nutritious, indigenous food crops that are suitable for African diets, but also are suitable for our climate? And also organic, sustainable growing practices that aren't heavy reliant on chemicals. So sustainable agriculture is a practice that is slowly being adopted by farmers. And however, due to the market demand and pricing, farmers usually choose conventional crops that are, that are easier to grow and have a higher turnaround in making profit. In my own experience, from moving from conventional crops to indigenous crops, I have seen opportunities in the informal sector in delivering nutritious food to people, especially in urban areas. People in urban spaces still have a demand for uh, nutritious indigenous products and in introducing these products to the commercial market is difficult um, because we face challenges is that there's not a lot of research in terms of, you know, uh, production guides and how can we grow these uh, foods at a commercial level. Um, so there is a need for private sector to work with people, especially in accessing heirloom seeds understanding indigenous growing practices, as well as to work with research partners to ensure that we can formalize these practices. 
And then I think that it's also up to the farmers to develop the value chains and to create uh, products that people in the urban spaces value. Um, and if more farmers actually started to grow, um, um, deciding on to grow particular food um, that is, uh, you know, uh, highlighted or targeting specific nutritional needs within the population, I think then through access, people now will start adopting and remembering these old indigenous foods and start um, consuming them because they will have access to them in the urban spaces. Uh, they don't, the, the behavior change that is required to encourage consumers to, to purchase the foods that you are describing that can drive the opportunities for farmers to earn income from producing these foods. You heard uh, the previous speaker uh, talk about the need for education at the community level to, to support household behavior change. How does the private sector support that type of commu community education, consumer education, that will drive the changes in demand, creating the opportunity for, for farmers to increase production because of that consumer demand. I think as farmers, we need to be in tune with food trends um, and really understand what is the consumer needs. Now consumers are very interested in highly uh, dense, nutritious food, um, superfoods. And since um, I've started growing indigenous crops and showing people how can they incorporate this into their into their diets, you know, taking something as a African kale and incorporating it into smoothies, and actually showing people that they can still live their modern lifestyle and um, uh, and access these foods. So I think it's the way that we need to unpack it, and it needs different. Um, levels in the value chain when we as a farmer being able to communicate to uh to to chefs as well being getting chefs to actually incorporate these foods at their restaurants to do demonstrations to show people that you know what you, we can be able to access these foods so it's really really uh, trying to make the food cool again because when people interact with these foods is usually in the rural spaces and they would remember them to say you know my granny used to grow this in their backyard now when they see it in the store they just need to find a way how can i access it and what how do i translate um taking something simple as um, indigenous nuts and making uh, peanut butter with that and so i think it really needs the farmer the producer to be creative and start making products that actually speak to the consumer and their current lifestyles creative farmers i don't know any farmers who are not creative thank you very much for those mm -hmm. comments let's go mm -hmm. to dr johan swinnen um, and here from his, as someone who has spent his career studying these issues, how can we better support the policies that transform food systems to, with evidence and research? And how do the indicators, as described by Dr. Haddad in his opening statement, support the, the development of better policies? Over to you, Johan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are uh, we are having some technical problems of uh, getting me linked up to the conference, and actually, I failed to hear most of what was presented in the uh, both in terms of the presentation of, of Dr. Haddad and the discussion afterwards. I was asked by the organizers to comment on, on, the, uh, on the use of nutritional indicators and the role they could play in the African um, green revolution in growing Africa's food. Now, Dr. Haddad has um, shown this great new initiative on uh, nutrition indicators and making them available and making them much more easy to access both for policy analysts and for policy advisors uh, I was asked to comment on um, on another aspect of these indicators, and which is the type of indicators that we have been using and that we should be using for uh, the future. I should thank Marie Ruel, who is our division head at IFPRI for um, nutrition and poverty and health, for uh, many discussions I had with her, and I learned a lot from that. She's been working on these issues for most of her career. 
Now, for a long time, we have been using uh, child anthropometric measurements to measure nutritional outcomes, things like weight, uh, weight for age, height for age, weight for age, set scores, et cetera. And these help us track um, indicators and we can track those at population levels over time and across different uh, groups of society. These are good development indicators that correlate well with national and global changes in poverty and food security. And it's, uh, these data are available for many countries through demographic and health surveys, which are collected at regular intervals. We can also separate female and male uh, anthropometric data for tracking changes over time and for looking at gender difference, for example. And so for all these reasons, these indicators have been used extensively in the past and have been quite useful. But of course, these are proxies and they are not perfect. And I think for looking forward, we should be thinking about uh, doing better in, in. Unfortunately, it appears that Johan's screen has frozen. A uh, weakness that we have with the current indicators is that we still lack national level data across countries and across diets. And these are needed for assessing where the populations are consuming dying that are nutritious and healthy. Okay, nutritious meaning whether they meet daily nutrient requirements and healthy both for human health and for planet health, if you want. Um, whether our diet composition or the existing or the future diet composition is consistent with that. Now, collecting such data is a lot more time consuming, it's complex, it's costly, and it is certainly more than currently what we do, the children's anthropometry indicators. So this is a, a weakness in our data. We are, have efforts on the way, not just uh, at IFPRI, but in many different institutions to simplify the data collection analysis to ger generate simple global indicators on diet quality. Yet there's still a need for major investment, I think, in funding survey data collection in national representative samples in a large number of countries. And we need these to leverage the role of food systems to ensure healthy, safe, affordable and sustainable diets in order in order to do that okay we need just better data and more representative data what we also still lack information on is on individual micronutrient status and on the most widespread micronutrient deficiencies and again we should have better data across countries regions and different groups within society and so these data are very important given the fact that um, the poor micronutrient status of people affects, of course, their immunity, their health, and their survival. To collect these data, to get better uh, information on that, that requires blood samples. Okay, And this is, of course, a much more invasive assessment uh, when we try to collect this type of information. And it also faces limits in terms of funding, financial support, support to conduct such service at the national representative level. And so if we look forward in terms of the types of addition uh, indicators, data that we need, these are the types of things I think we should do for the future. So we should invest in measuring diets in large national representative data uh, surveys, data collections. And at the same time, we should focus more on trying to get better indicators, better data using uh, collections of blood samples as part of larger uh, surveys and more targeted subsample elements of these surveys where we can collect these at a cheaper cost. Let me end here and give the floor back to you. Thank you. We translate that better data then into better policy and more investment to ensure that we are creating companies and programs, uh, public sector programs and private sector companies that are providing the resources that will create the impact that we hope to achieve in nutrition outcomes. And I'm hoping this is being translated to Dr. Swinnon. And I apologize to our audience. We are trying to work um, to get the, the 
information transcribed for Dr. Swinnon so that he can um, provide I'm us with his through response. the chat uh, a question on how do we translate uh, data to better policy and investment decisions. Well, I think this is an this is really a political economy question. And so it's a question which is not just related to, to I think, or, or relevant for uh, nutrition. It's a, a question which relates to almost any policy decision, right? I think there, uh, my experience in advising um, policymakers is that in order to be effective, there is a number of things that need to work. First of all, you have to ask the right questions and you have to have the data ready. That's where the data issue is so important to basically to support the, um, <clears throat> the analysis that you do and the advice that you're going to give. But you also have to bring it in a, in a framework in a way that is understandable for policymakers. And it makes it easy for them to basically link the, the, the question that they have or they try to answer with what are the options that they face? What are the decisions? If op uh, decision option A or decision option B or decision option C is going in a certain way, and not just look at, okay, what's the efficiency effect in terms of what's the overall nutrition outcome, but also how is it going to affect certain groups within a country? Is it going to affect uh, children differently than adults? Is it going to affect certain ethnic groups, certain social groups differently than other groups? All these things are important. So it's always important, I think, to separate the, uh, the, the efficiency effect, the, the, the health effects as a general and at the same time, the distributional effects, how it's affecting certain groups in society differently. Because for policymakers, these things are important. Policymakers always have worry not just about the benefit of society as well, but also about how it's affecting different groups in society differently. And I think uh, finally, I think always it's crucial that you as, um, as policy advisors or analysts that we turn whatever we find or complicated analysis into indicators, into insights, which are easily uh, digestible for them and what they can use the type of information to convince their, uh, their clients, if you want, which can be their, their, their voters or their political support groups or really the, um, the people on whom or the groups on whom they would like to have this uh, policy change or policy reform to be implemented upon. Thank you. I'd like to go back to our, our keynote speaker to ask for him to, so we can end where we began. And as you've listened to the comments from the private sector, from the institutional experts working and leading in this area, as well as the research leader, uh, Dr. Swinnon, the, the issues regarding data and support for data the, and, and to make the indicators more valuable to their work at each of these level, levels has come through loud and clear. How do we as a community overcome this data challenge to ensure that the indicators that we develop are context specific and robust enough for us to drive the decision making that is necessary in each of the communities required to move nutrition forward? Back to you, Lawrence. I really enjoyed the panelists' comments and uh, observations and reflections. And uh, thank you, Erthrin, for fabulously chairing this session. I, I um, you know, I think, you know, data are signals. They, they represent signals to guide and spur action. And it's really extraordinary, when you think about it, that the number one driver of the burden of disease in every country, whether it's in, in sub-Saharan Africa or in Scandinavia, the number one driver of the global burden of disease is poor diets. And we absolutely do not know how to measure diet in an, in an easy, comparable, subnational, rapid way. It's extraordinary. You know, we look at economists, I'm an economist, several of us on this panel are economists, and people who worry about macro and microeconomy they pour over new data every week, sometimes every day. There's, there's a continuous flow of data driving and, and guiding economic decisions so that we can make optimal decisions on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. We don't have any of that 
in the food system space. And that I think is because one of the things that COVID-19 has really showed us and really revealed is that our data collection infrastructure, Earthrin, is so 20th century. It's extraordinary. It hasn't changed much from when I was doing a PhD 20, uh, 35 years ago. It's still people with clipboards. Instead of a clipboard, it might be a data. It's really expensive. We need to figure out new ways of collecting data, of cutting out middle, middle men and middle women, um, using handheld um, phones, using AI, using big data, using um, polling platforms that are global platforms. We need to figure out new ways of doing this. And we need to somehow figure out who's going to pay for this. It's so inexpensive to collect data. But of course, no company really wants to do it other than for their own purposes. And indeed, he said, it's expensive. So it's expensive. It's tailored to my needs. I don't want to share it with anyone else. It's my data. And that's totally defensible. But so that's why it's a public good. And that's why public agencies should be investing in it. But, but overseas development assistance organizations don't like investing in it because it's very difficult to justify to the citizens and countries who want to see that their ODA is saving children's lives. So this is really a job for governments, perhaps supported by philanthropies. We have to figure out new ways of investing in data that allow us to, to see. If we don't see, we're, we're literally stumbling around in the dark. And who's going to suffer? It's not us. It's people who are, who are at risk of malnutrition. Uh, and it's, the, and it's the, the climate, the greenhouse gases and the climate. So, you know, I, I, I hear what everyone's saying. Data is not the only solution. You need to have people who want to use the data. But the supply of data is, is undersupplied. And um, governments and other agencies need to step up. Over. Well, thank you very much for those closing comments, uh, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, the, just as the opening, you provide us with a great deal of food for thought, nutritious food for thought, and a recognizing that these are not easy issues. But those, all of us have been in this space for so long, we know that we are not where we need to be, as they say, but we are far from where we were five or definitely 10 years ago. And we're moving in the right direction. These indicators that you've outlined, the data that was that was uh, discussed by Dr. Wells, as well as Dr. Dr. Uh, demonstrate that we are moving in the right direction. The work that the private sector is doing is identified by Ndidi and the changes that are being made at farm level as discussed by Thedo. Each of you presented the forward progress that we as a community are making, but what you've all underscored is the work must go on, that the efforts must continue, and that we must have additional investment in this space. Not for us, as, as Lauren said, but those who depend on us to get this right, to ensure that we're addressing the challenges of nutrition, undernutrition, uh, as well as the growing problem of obesity. I thank you all for your participation today. I apologize to you for the technical challenges, and I thank our audience for joining us. Thank you, Agra, for convening this very important conversation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Etrin.